So this is the first episode of uh, Simulated Reality. Uh, that's a podcast by Analytics India magazine, and uh, we have our first guest, Siddharth Pai. He is the CFO and founding partner of Three Four One Capital, three which Three One Four Capital. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting name. And uh, he runs it with his brother Pranav. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a huge fund. So Siddharth. How how is it like running this fun? You know, uh, engaging with startups. You know, searching for the next big company. You know, it's interesting. So we started off three one four in twenty sixteen with uh, with a fund size of about hundred crores. We're now in the year twenty nineteen. We're reaching a fund size of close to eight hundred. So we eight x within the span of three years. Yeah, which is fantastic for a fund. What most of the people don't uh, see the the interesting part about a, about running a fund is of course finding the startups and all that uh, sorry for, for finding companies but one of the hardships about running a fund that people don't understand it's actually trying to raise capital for a mm-hmm. fund so if you're an entrepreneur you have your 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 feet on the stage you're the one actually driving the entire business right? so yeah. it's easier for you to actually control your pnl control your prog- control revenue drive uh, uh, where to allocate money etc but as an investor you're a degree away from the action you're investing into a company that in turn is actually driving all that business So even all the impact that you actually have, the metrics that you need to actually evaluate your fund on, actually significantly differ from that from from that of an entrepreneur as well. So this particular shift is something that most people don't understand about raising a fund because see, no investor invests in a company for the privilege of running it. Mm-hmm. There's always a bifurcation bifurcation between the investor as well as the as well as the founder who's actually running it. Yeah. So that distinction becomes important. And we started off three one four as well. One of our primary learnings is in spite of in spite of this being a game of money, it's actually a game of people. Yeah. Like you're investing not into a business, you're not not investing business plan into a platform they use, whether they use this framework, that framework, etc. You're actually investing into the person, mm-hmm. and unless that person actually can actually pivot or change with the times and actually drive drive that business and create growth, you're not actually going to see much. So especially yeah. in the early stage, which is the kind of fund we are, there are no metrics. There's no historic. There's no historic background for the company, right? It's just a, it's just a few people who actually gotten together. They created something. They have an MVP out. They have a few paying customers. They may not even have a few paying customers. Their product may still be in beta, but they come to you like, "Hey, here's our entire plan." And you have to evaluate that. Mm. So a large number of funds. Uh, if you talk to a number of people, they say, oh, "We're going to look at the business. You look at the business plan. You look at the pedigree of the founders. You look at how large the market is. You look at TAM, SAM, and all these other metrics." Mm. At the end of the day, it boils down to the person you're actually investing into. And unless that unless that person, you feel that person doesn't pass a smell test, it doesn't pass muster, then that doesn't actually happen. So yeah. as we start off three one four as well, that's one of been one of our primary learnings. It's actually a people game more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, the game of people, kind of like the Game of Thrones, I guess. Oh yeah. Ah, yeah, it is a Game of Thrones because. Yeah. See, even in, even if you look at venture as a space as of now, the amount of capital is it's attracting is actually become absurd, right? Yeah. India is raising twelve to fourteen. India, in fact, last year actually raised about twelve billion dollars yeah. within the span of within the span of one year itself. India is historically raising between twelve to fourteen billion dollars. Mm. We're third in the entire world behind uh, US, US and China. Mm. We're actually neck to neck with the UK, but now with Brexit and all that, India is actually has an edge edge yeah. over the UK when it comes to that now. And the reason for this, and the reason why this is actually becoming Mind boggling is this because ventures are attracting more amount of capital than ever did in the entire world. If you actually look at the reason why for this, is because when it comes to an asset allocation perspective, I'm, I'm on the board of a pension fund or university mm. endowment or something. I have I have five to ten billion dollars at my fingertips. Now that five to ten billion dollars, there are certain liabilities I need to pay off. I need to make sure I hit a certain return, a certain rate of return, so I can actually pay back whatever obligations I have. If I have a pension fund, for example, I need to make sure the pensions and all actually go through. Now, in order for that to happen, I need to I need to be growing. I need to be growing my entire fund at a certain CAC. Right? Mm. Where where can you actually do that in the entire world? Your listed markets aren't growing as quickly, and there's a lot of variation that actually happens over there. Government bonds, there are now negative interest rate mm. bonds that have yeah. actually come out. We have fifteen trillion dollars of negative yields. Yeah, that's humongous. Yeah. That's paying fifteen trillion dollars worth of capital. Where someone gives you fifteen trillion, you pay them. They they are happy to get a haircut on that. No one else in the entire no one yeah. else in the history of the world has that happened. That's one of the reasons why ventures attract actually attracting so much capital. And if you look at the world, you look at the world as a whole as of now. China's GDP figures came out. They are officially officially at six percent. The thumb rule that most people joke about for China is any government figure half by two uh, divided by two, and you actually get the real growth figure. So China is growing about three and a half four percent. And the US is growing at two and a half, three percent. Europe is decelerating as of now. Yeah. Australia has been rece- hasn't had recession long time, but it's not growing yeah. as quickly. They're having their own troubles with China when it comes to a variety of issues. 
Africa is still in the nascent stage, it's still coming up now. There are pockets of innovation there, but as a whole, it hasn't picked up. And Latin America is literally burning. I know. <laughs> Chile and all these places are literally burning. Like the Amazon fire, the, the uh, Amazon forest is on fire. Uh, Chile and all is burning. So India is one of the last bastions of growth left in the entire yeah. world. And that's why when India's growth rate went down from 7% to 5%, everyone started shivering. Because yeah. if India goes down, the world isn't growing. 90% mm. of the world is actually slowing down as per the IMF. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why venture has become so attractive as an asset class now. Because venture is one of the few places where 2x, 3x growth is actually the norm. It's not an exception. So that's why it's attracting so much more capital. And this is the world we actually now inhabit, where capital, capital is effectively, is no longer scarcity of capital, it's an abundance of capital. There's mm. a scarcity of ideas, a scarcity of execution. Okay. So unless you can do these two well and find the people and actually do it, you're not going to survive in this game. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, slowing economy, you know, the growth rate is declining as well. But, you know, the Indian, obviously, the startup ecosystem is attracting a lot of money. So, I mean, there's obviously this uh, contrast between the economy and the amount of funds that they're raising. Like, you know, what do you think about that part? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and uh, is it is it fake? Is it real? What is it? No, so I think, see, there is a... There's no one-to-one correlation between the size of the economy as well as the amount of capital that you achieve raise. Yeah. There isn't. Like if you look at Israel, for example, for an economy at that size, the amount of capital they raise is humongous. Yeah. Right. But I would say, see, what what capital actually chases now is growth. Mm. So India is, like I said, India is one of the largest engines of growth left in the entire world. And India also has a large percentage of its population actually coming, actually, uh, actually becoming coming out of a formal economy. Mm. These are people who are coming online thanks to Jio. I mean, we have to actually hats off to Jio because Jio entirely changed the landscape of the whole of India. I just want to digress for a second. Before Jio came about in the year 2014, our mobile monthly mobile data consumption was 86, 86 MB on a per capita basis. That's yeah. nothing. Mm. Right? 86 MB is, is a fraction of an app right now. It's, it's one yeah. video as you watch. India, thanks to Jio, after Jio came in, India now consumes 11.6 GB of mobile data on a per capita basis. Yeah. On a per capita monthly basis. That's humongous. The US consumes about 2.3 to 2.4 GB. China consumes, I think, between about 3.8 to 4.2 GB. India is the largest in the entire world. And because all these people are coming online, they're all transacting online, they're paying online, they come on. India has a fantastic opportunity for the rest of the world. Yeah. So even though India's formal economy may have to be going down, it's slowing down. If you look at the reasons why, car sales have actually come down. Now, yeah. let's actually analyze the reason why car sales and all have actually happened. I've actually written about this as well. All this, all this happened when the ILFS crisis took place, uh, took place early September. And the moment ILFS actually happened at that point in time, there was, there was a significant issue. Now, the, people say ILFS happened because they didn't get some of their dues on time. They couldn't actually manage the asset liability mismatch. There were short-term borrowings against long-term investments. There were a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is also the fact that they had large amount of dues from the government. They claim it's 16,000 crores. The government, NHAI claims about 4,000 crores. But that money, if it came on time, would have actually helped them survive. Now, when ILFS, right after ILFS started happening, we didn't create a bad bank. We didn't actually take concrete steps to actually mitigate that particular part. And when that particular, that quarter was essentially lost. The quarter, and during that particular quarter as well, the finance minister was in the best of health. Uh, Shri Arun Jaitley, may God bless his soul, was actually in, in, in and out of hospitals at that point in time. And after that particular quarter, we had uh, this one, Piyush Goyal, I believe, who became, who became the finance uh, who, who, who became the finance minister, right? And he became the finance minister for that budget. And even though it was an interim budget, he actually, he actually created a budget that laid the framework for the next five mm. years. And right after that, so that entire quarter went in terms of the budget and actually debating that. The quarter after that was the elections. There's not much government activity that happens in the election because there is no government per se. You're actually forming the entire new government there. And right after that particular piece, when we, when we closed the June quarter, July onwards, we had the next budget coming in. And the next budget, unfortunately, the biggest... I would say weak point in that budget was the fact that they actually they actually taxed trusts along with individuals at a 37% surcharge. And the moment that particular surcharge came in, when all the investors looked at India in terms of the post-tax rewards, India wasn't as attractive a destination anymore. They actually believed India was overvalued, which is why India lost two lakh crores in terms mm. of market value yeah. in the span of one month. And after that happened, we had a series of reverses where we gone back. We've scaled that back for scaled that back for investors, for FPIs, for FPIs and FIs. Indian investors still face a problem, and it's only there for individuals now. So, in the span of one year, the fact that the ILFS crisis was actually left unmitigated to a large extent mm-hmm. actually shows why India started slowing down. And in India's, if you look at India's legal framework, India's banking or credit framework, banks are the origination of credit because all deposits actually come into a bank and banks are lending. 
banks are actually banks are the most nimble when it comes to lending because they have RBI regulations stating how they're supposed to lend, what is this, uh, how they're supposed to recognize their peers, where the areas they can lend, where the areas they can't lend to, what is the process for lending. At the moment, that process doesn't make them nimble. So they started using NBFCs as a sort of intermediary for credit. And the NBFCs actually becomes a last mile in terms of distributing credit to everyone. People don't get loans from banks, quantitatively. They actually get a larger number of loans from NBFCs for consumer durables, mm -hmm. to buy cars and all this. So India's car slowdown isn't something that happened because the economy slowed down. It's happened because there's no there's no liquidity coming reaching the end consumer. Okay. There is systemic liquidity. Okay. Uh, Rajneesh Kumar of SBI said that we are sitting on one lakh crores. We don't know where to lend it. Mm. You have NBFCs now who can't who can't raise any money because all the banks want to touch them with a the barge pole. Because of what happened with DHFL, what happened in India Bulls Housing Finance, what happened with uh, Reliance Capital and a number of them. So the yeah. NBFCs are now paining. They can't they can't lend. And for the end borrower who couldn't actually get a loan from a bank, for example, went to an NBFC, he can't borrow from there either. And if I'm going to buy an asset like a house or a car, I'm not going to do it out of pure equity. I don't have that amount of savings. I'm going to do it out of credit. So the moment the credit actually dried up, India started slowing. Yeah. And for us to solve these credit issues to actually ensure that credit and liquidity reaches the last month, NBFC should not be given the stepmotherly treatment that currently be given by RBI as of now. And the moment that changes, within a couple of quarters, we should actually see the entire macro situation changing to a much larger extent. So this explains India's deceleration. Mm. So startups as well aren't that badly affected by this. Mm. Because see, the rent the startups actually do, startups don't make, don't make Maruti cars. They don't make cars, they don't, they don't actually sell houses. They're in terms of technology and technology enablement. These particular things actually help reduce friction. So when it comes to underwriting a loan or something, if it's slightly riskier, banks are looking to start up and say, okay, listen, you guys have an underwriting engine that seems to work for this MBFC or for these lenders. When we actually partner up, let me know how that works so I can start reaching out to them. So it's actually been a boon for startups, for a number of startups. It's been a bane for some of the more lending startups. Mm -hmm. Some of the more lending heavy startups haven't been able to raise capital in this particular climate. And that's actually causing an issue for them. So whether or not how we see this come about in the next few years will determine their whether they survive, but India as a whole, India as a whole continue chugging along and Indian startups will continue to outpace the growth that India currently has. Yeah, well, that's a, you know, brilliant explanation of how the economy is unfolding at the moment. So for you, uh, what do you look in a startup? What are the different aspects that you consider, you know, before giving them your money? Uh, if you could tell that about that, that'll be like... Yeah, of course. Yeah. Huh? So there are there are some trade secrets and some secret yeah. sources that you can't, <laughs> can't exactly... Uh, yeah. Can't exactly... Uh, Articulate, yeah. but what we can see one of the things we always look for is one of the first things we look for is about the founder and mm -hmm. the founding team itself. What is the chemistry between them? Because see, ultimately, like I said, investing is a people's game. Yeah. Your money is essentially just inventory, right? You can give it off. You can there, yeah. there is a capital. You figure out where to actually allocate it. Who to actually give it to? And yeah. once you give it to that particular person, you can't just suck it back out. It's not. It's not like a mutual fund scheme that gets yeah. you get the money back, right? Yeah. It's, it's like a marriage, huh? oh. you actually get in. So we look at the we look at the founding team and look at the chemistry between them as well as the competence the founders have. Mm. So if I'm a founder who may be really enthusiastic, maybe doing really well, but I have no competence in that particular field. Unless I can show an ability to attract a team, attract mm. a team and build a team around me, then we actually, see, we actually decide to pass on this particular opportunity. The second thing, let's say everyone actually sees is what is the role of technology when it comes to this particular company. So we're a tech fund, in case you're selling like if selling shampoos or something, that's good, that's great. But unless it's a strong element of tech, we can't do much. Yeah. One of the thesis we have at 314 is that we don't want to just be dumb capital on your cap table. Yeah. If we, the moment we invest, we also we also want to lend our experience. We also want to lend we also want to lend the entire backing and the entire framework that we have onto the startup as well, right? Because we don't just lend you we don't just give you money and then sit back sit back get your MISs frequently and after they say, that, okay, fine, I want an exit in two three years. It doesn't work that way. We also want to help them build that entire business. Okay. So what is what is the role that 314 can actually play within the business is something we analyzed we analyzed to a much larger extent. Then of course you have your hygiene factors like okay, what is the size of the market? Are you guys what is the competition that's actually there? Because we live Sabai, we live now we now live in an age where capital is used as a weapon. Mm -hmm. So the only per, the first person to weaponize capital, according to me, has actually been Masa San of Softbank. Mm -hmm. Because what Softbank <laughs> realized, okay, fine, see, there are there are all these companies coming out are gonna be like the next Google, they're gonna be the next yeah. Facebook. They're, these guys are gonna drive the next hundred years. I see yeah. Softbank, that vision statement I think he put out about two, three years ago. It's actually floating around on the internet and all. You should actually read that. It's yeah. the most brilliant articulation of SoftBank's vision ever. So he doesn't care about what's happening in the short term now. He has yeah. a hundred year vision, he's hundred year vision and said, I'm gonna achieve that no matter what. So his he weaponized capital. He realized that people are raising 500 million funds, 1 billion funds. He says, grow all this is not yeah. worth it. I would raise a one, I would raise a hundred billion dollar fund. 
I will get the best startups in all these particular verticals. I will pump them with money. I'll get them to a high valuation, keep them private for a while, and then I'll see, and then I'll see, get them to go list. So has that thesis worked out? Some people say no. I'm still of the opinion that it's still, it's still a work in progress. So WeWork was one of the largest debacles that's actually happened now. Yeah. But the word on the street is he's taken over. He's taken over. I think he's just 80, 80, 85 percent of WeWork as of now. There are plans. There are rumors apparently that he may try rolling WeWork into OYO. Okay. So OYO has now moved to the US, it's moved to Japan, it's actually mm. bring, bringing up. So if they roll WeWork into OYO, that's going to that's gonna be a massive thing, right? Yeah. So Mas as a person doesn't let one failure actually cripple his entire business. Yeah. He actually the one failure, okay, it's a failure, it happened, cool, let me, actually, let me actually try rolling about. So as an entrepreneur, the guy is fantastic. That shows how important people are in this entire business. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you look at the Indian startup ecosystem, I mean, we had concerns for, for example, angel tax, and the government has uh, obviously relaxed a lot of the things. But from your perspective, you know, uh, what is not going right, you know, from the side of the government? Is, oh, it, is it? Yeah. So if we could talk about that, you know, that would be really interesting. So see, even the issue of angel tax, I'll actually give you a brief 30 second overview of angel tax before yeah. we have into it. So angel tax happened in, happened in the year 2012, during the previous co- Congress regime, where they were yeah. discovered that certain people, uh, certain people actually started laundering money by putting high, by, by actually investing that money as high share, high share premium into companies, into mm. private companies. So the way the entire jig worked is, the ED actually found this out. There are, the name of the person who precipitated all this is available online, I'm not going to mention it here. But they started investing into like a private company without any business at a really high pre- a really high premium. Mm. And then they would actually buy back those shares from the investor at like a normal normal mm. fashion. So essentially, if I had like let's say 500 crores or something, I take 10% of your company, I put the entire 500 crores in. Yeah. Then, so I, I don't need a valuation report, yeah. I don't need anything else, I can actually put that money in. And then when I had to get bought out, I get bought out at like the book value. And mm-hmm. the book value is going to be much less than the 500 mm-hmm. crores. So I pay a small amount out, I have control over the entire 500 crores and 100% control of the company. Mm-hmm. This was the ill that Angel, that section 5627B was created to actually stymie. me. But look at how it's been misapplied to startups now. They're going after startups that manage to raise capital from Indian sources at a premium. All startups raise a premium because if my company, the way the startup valuations work is, okay, I have X amount of money, I want Y percent of your company. People negotiate and they come up on a valuation in that particular regard. So premium is a high, comp- premium is a mathematical consequence of it, mm. nothing else. They say, I want so much of your company, my face value, your premiums, your issue price is kind of comprises of face value and premium. But face value is set, let's say 10 rupees, 100 rupees, some small amount. And your premium is a remaining part. So if I issue shares, are, let's say 10,000 rupees a share, and my face value is rupees 1, that means 9,999 bucks stands as premium. That doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. It's mathematics, right? Because yeah. I chose to my face value to be one buck. Th- that's how it becomes. But unfortunately, for the tax department, it's looking at this saying, okay, fine, this is high premium actually going about. I believe there might be some hanky-panky that they started taxing, taxing all this at 30%. 30% two years yeah. after they raise money. So imagine I'm a startup. In the mm-hmm. year, let's say 2016, I raise capital. I go about my way, I, I do everything. In the year 2018, when I'm about to go raise capital again, I suddenly get a notice saying, okay, 30% of the money you raised two years ago, yeah. you, you pay to me as tax. Whoa. I can't go raise money. No investor is going to come put money into my company because they're going to say, hey, I put money into you. You're going to use that to pay off your tax liability. Yeah. It's okay. Like you deal with that situation then, then I'll come, then come back to me after. So these guys couldn't actually raise money. Because they couldn't raise money, it became... They couldn't actually survive as a business. Mm. Capital is a lifeline of a business. So angel tax struck at the very heart of startups. And it struck at the most vulnerable uh, vulnerable part of startups, early stage startups. It didn't go after an OYO, an, an OLA or anyone else, right? Yeah. Those guys are massive. They can actually go get the best guys. Went after really small guys. And angel tax, so the entire, entire fraternity got together, fought it out. But angel tax are not solved as of yet, if you ask me. Okay. The thing about angel tax, what most people don't look at, in the circular, there's a negative list of investments a startup can't make hmm. for seven years after they applied, after they raised capital. And these are investing into shares and securities, okay. making any loans and advances, hmm. and making any capital contributions. Loans and advances include your advanced, uh, loans and uh, advances are classified under Schedule 2 of the Companies Act. Hmm? These are classified as your advance tax and your tax, the tax you pay, the, the, uh, the advance tax, is technically a loan and advance. Your salary advance is a loan and advance. The advance you give to vendors and you know, for actually building something. If you're getting furniture made, you, know, you pay them an advance before it gives you the final thing. Those are all advances. Hmm. All those actually ban, all those actually preclude you from getting the instant tax benefit. And shares and securities, most, most companies do treasury management. They can't do treasury management anymore. They can't create subsidiaries now. Yeah. Because they're going to make an investment. So instant tax has not been solved. And see, this actually feeds into a broader question in terms of India's policy framework. 
India doesn't create policies to catch for the norm. India doesn't create policies for the norm. They create policies for the exception. To catch one group, they don't mind. Even if 99 people actually have to suffer, they don't actually mind those 99 people suffering. That entire framework needs to actually change. Mm. And unless that framework changes, India is still going to have this particular policy issue that's still crippling it as of now. It's important for the government to realize that the role of government is not to dictate how business has to be run. Mm. The role of government is to set the rules of the entire playground. And then let people actually play within that sphere. And the way they set those rules shouldn't be, okay, I decide, I'm government, I decide that this is how the rules have to be set. The way the rules have to be set is you need to speak to all the stakeholders within that ecosystem and say, okay, here's what we actually want to do. That has to be a more consultative approach. Yeah. And unless we have a more consultative approach, our policy, our regulatory and policy risk are still going to be one of the systemic risk factors that actually come into the equation when deciding whether to invest in India or not. Yeah. So this feeds into a broader thing of the broader, broader role of government when it actually when it actually comes to startups and when it comes to technology as a whole. Yeah. So you are a chartered accountant. You just don't give money to startups. You know, you engage with them constantly. Mm. You account each yeah. and every rupee, right? So, what are the different ways in which you know startups use money, and how do you then uh, go about? Do 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 you give them the flexibility, or do you you know obviously account them for all? So the we let them. So what we do is see, we don't invest in the company for the privilege of running it. Yeah, that's one. Of, that's one of the. That's 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 a fundamental principle of our entire investment thesis. So the moment we invest, we ask them for a business plan. Mm. How are they going to use that particular money? And then we help. We engage with them and what those business plan points are. So yeah. if you actually analyze the business plan of most of the startups coming up, a large chunk of their burn actually goes into three areas. It goes into salaries. It goes into uh, human capital. It goes into t- technology, which are framework use AWS, Facebook, mm. sorry yeah. AWS, uh, uh, Rails, etc. And it goes into marketing. Marketing, okay. And marketing is one of the biggest cash burners around <laughs> because I kid you not, Indian startups, technically speaking, before an investor invests in, twenty percent of that money should actually just be given straight to straight to like Facebook or Google or someone because that's where that money is eventually going to end up to. Okay. In terms of marketing, we need to cut down the amount of marketing spend we do and actually reduce the customer acquisition cost. Mm. That becomes one of the fundamental burners for almost every single startup that actually comes about. The technology cost actually becomes easier to do because we have an in-house tech team at three one four. One of few funds are actually have four active engineers who still write code. Okay. Who still write code day in and day out. Hmm? So these people actually sit with the companies and help them rationalize their tech cost because AWS cost for a number of them is actually it's actually inflated, right? Mm. And we actually work with the AWS team also to help them rationalize those particular costs. Yeah. Like we actually we have we have like monthly meetings with them to figure out okay here's what we're actually seeing. How do you, how can you guys actually have these startups? And AWS team has actually been really receptive. We similarly engage with Google Cloud and a number of them as well. So technology becomes a second burner. Yeah. And the first burner as always is going to be salaries, right? Mm. Now, even when it comes to salaries as well, what a number of entrepreneurs, the mistake a number of entrepreneurs do is the moment they think that life is a linear equation. Okay. It's not. Like, okay, I have a team of 10 people, I'm actually earning so much. Mm. If I have a team of 100 people, I'm going to earn like 10 times that amount. It doesn't scale up that way. Okay. And the moment your team also expands, the entire the issues with managing all those people are actually come about as mm. well, right? And think about it is you can't, these people aren't uh, fungible, not dispensable. You can't hire people and then six months later actually go fire like yeah. 50% of them. Have you noticed one of the major bugbears against startups is the fact that they just go hire indiscriminately and they start firing a number of people. Mm, and everyone, yeah. uh, they shouldn't have hired them. So we help them with their hiring plan as well. So these are three areas of burn that actually happen for a startup. And the moment they start mitigating and reducing these particular areas, they can actually extend the runway to a much larger extent. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, the valuations. What impact could, you know, it have? Like if a startup is overvalued, let's say, you know, it's good for the founders. Obviously, they become richer and richer. But what impact it could have like on the future of the company if it's, let's say, overvalued? Never mistake paper gains for actual money in the pocket. Mm, so that's yeah. number one. Yeah. So you can have you can have a startup that on paper is valued at five billion, ten billion, but unless mm. the guy IPOs out and you can realize that money, yeah, it's all notional. Never ever mistake notional figures for actual money, right? And when it comes to a startup as well, see there is no there is no science to evaluation. Okay. Valuation is in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the investor. If an investor believes you're valued as so much, then that's cool. Then he actually puts in, puts in, puts in the money at that. But what people fail to understand about valuations is those valuations are based on certain metrics. Metrics that the company has achieved, metrics that the company has to achieve. And unless the company achieves those metrics, that's when we realize the, the company is overvalued or not. So when WeWork was going about, when it reached 47 billion, that eye-watering 47 billion <laughs> valuation, we realized, okay, dude, listen, it's it's hideously overvalued. Yeah. But when, throughout that entire process, there were people saying WeWork is overvalued, WeWork is not overvalued, they went through the entire thing. Mm. And people looked at Flipkart as well. Everyone thought Flipkart was overvalued for the longest period of time. But they exited at 16 billion. Yeah. They realized all that value. 
So that's the thing about valuation. It, you may be overvalued, you may be undervalued, but how do you justify that valuation? What are the metrics that are actually going to justify the valuation? What is the narrative you weave around it? The mm. moment you can master that, that actually decides whether your company is overvalued or undervalued or not. If you are overvalued, the one thing I'd be prepared is to actually take a haircut sometime later in the future, as well as all the um, restrictions and the terms that come with that haircut. Because the moment a haircut happens, your investor shareholding increases, your the founder shareholding actually decreases to a certain extent, there are certain negative covenants, etc. that actually come mm. on board as per the agreements, right? Okay. And founders should actually be aware of that also. So, there are times that the founders also realize that, I mean, it's a badge of honor saying, oh, I'm a unicorn, I'm a unicorn. <laughs> Unicorns have gone from being this fabled, yeah. fabled, mythical thing to being just like pregnant. They're all over the place. Yeah. Right now. Every <laughs> fellow no is a unicorn. Uni- unicorn, right? I think the founder of Basecamp or something actually showed how stupid a unicorn is, where his friend invested like uh, $1 for 0.00001% of the company, mm. and therefore he's valued at a unicorn. He valued oh. a unicorn because that's the way yeah. unicorns are actually valued. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. just a notional figure. How do you justify that valuation? And until you can exit out of that valuation, it's all mm. just paper gains. And you should never mistake paper gains for actual money in the pocket. And what about like revenue? Like uh, a lot of the companies don't even like make, you know, they're not even profitable. So uh, how do you justify that? And then the valuations are crazy, but yeah. at the same time, a lot of them are not even making money. Yeah. So I don't so understand this that. Feeds, see, this feeds into what the investors are looking at. So I start off by saying that there's a large amount of capital chasing venture because venture represents growth. Okay. And if all these startups are actually doing, all these guys are actually, they may be losing a lot of money, but they're actually growing month on month, they're growing day out, they're growing quarter on quarter, right? Okay. And for the investor chasing growth, okay. that's actually brilliant for them. Okay. Because see, it depends on who the investors. Indian investors chase profitability because mm. we come from a capital scarce yeah, nation. Yeah. Huh? All of us haven't grown up with like money pouring out of our pockets. Like there's like a, there's no soft bank for anyone in India, <laughs> right? The closest we have is actually You may the be the next soft bank, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. That's what. So see, that's the thing. India comes from a capital caste nation. So that's why we look at profitability and we start wondering how these guys are doing it. But people from the West and all actually look at growth because they mm. come from a capital surplus nation. They have negative interest rates. They have interest rate at 0% and all that. There's so much money flowing about. So those guys are chasing growth. So the Indian guys are trying to figure out how does it work with those guys chasing growth. So that's why Indian startups are more attractive to them because they're growing month on month, they're growing quarter on quarter, they're actually doing all that. Mm. But the key of all this is how do you, what is your path to profitability? Okay. Those are the three magic words that all, all startup founders have to start thinking about right now, right? Because see, you can keep growing and everything, but at the end of the day, the business you invest do into has to start throwing cash. It can't just mm. be a cash sink. It can't be a capital sink. So... Unless you can actually start throwing cash, have a path to start throwing cash, it's going to be really hard for you to actually continue navigating in this world as we go about. So profitability, it's a little premature to talk about profitability now for early stage companies. Some of them have now, because there's so much capital available, they're sacrificing profitability in the short term. Yeah. But they need to have a proven path to profitability. So in case the capital tap turns off, in case the music actually dies down, right? Yeah. who's going to be left standing? The guy who's going to be left standing is who has a business that can actually throw out cash, not just absorb cash. Yeah. So if you start looking at all startups through that lens, you start realizing who's overvalued, who's undervalued. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's come to the technology part because right, our audience will get confused because they might think that we have become like a business economics, channel. Economics <laughs> podcast. So in terms of technology, like what do you look for? I mean, what are the hot technologies uh, that you're focusing on, you know? Mm. So before I answer that, let me actually put it this way. If you come to someone and say that, oh, I'm, a, I'm an AI startup, I'm an ML startup, mm. we actually, in-house, we call them Malai startups because ML, ML, AI is like Malai. Everyone believes every, okay. everyone, everyone believes that they're, they're the cream of the crop, right? Mm. But see, the thing is, what are the frameworks you actually use and how do you approach it? If you use TensorFlow and off-the-shelf, off-the-shelf ML competence and put them into a large data lake, what do you actually achieve? Mm. What is the innovation you're bringing about? The only... I would say more that you have is the fact you have a large amount of data. But mm. data is actually becoming a lot cheaper. Mm. And data is oil, if you believe the rest of the world, or data is sunshine, if you actually speak to Google, right? Yeah. Google is now like, oh, we have to change the entire data as oil. Maybe narrative. they don't want to use a dirty word. Like they don't want to use a dirty word like oil. And also, oil makes them seem like those oil barons and all. No one yeah. can actually harness sunshine. You'll yeah. see like, oh, I'm a solar Sunshine guy. is like happiness. Sunshine yeah. is happiness. That's exactly what they're trying to do, right? But see, but a technology framework as well, you need to figure out which are the frameworks you're applying directly into business. So what are the business outcomes of that? Mm. So AI and ML, if you ask me, AI and ML are now actually become the way the internet was in the late 90s. Mm. It's become one of those fundamental drivers of your business. It's become hygiene almost. Mm. You can always say I'm an AI startup. That's like saying I'm an internet business. Mm. No, because I have a website. I'm an AI startup because I happen to use some amount of artificial intelligence in it. You have to use it. How do you actually use that AI? What business outcomes does that actually drive? How do, has it helped you increase revenue? Has that actually helped you decrease your expenses? Has it helped you increase market penetration? 
show the impact of the technology you actually use rather than technology for the sake of technology mm. itself right unless you're unless you're a deep tech startup the technology you know you actually build isn't as isn't as as much of a vanity point as what people think as you scale up and as you grow up and how that technology drives business outcome that's what's going to determine like look at google for example mm. google's a tech company even that but that tech is actually throwing out tons and tons of cash that page rank algorithm that they actually wrote that they wrote in the 90s mm. late 90s is what's actually driving driving the core of their business okay the innovation they've actually created in terms of android innovation that they created in terms of putting out chrome os in terms of buying buying youtube helping scaling up to that particular extent that's actually shown so the fundamental frameworks they've used have actually done it uber for example as well uh, the uber the uber engineer blog how they've actually architected uber out how they managed to scale to that large an extent have almost zero downtime managed to connect to someone those are interesting technological frameworks so that's how technology becomes a business enabler yeah. we talk about it in the outcomes right a stark contrast to this that's we work we work called as a tech company i failed to see an element of tech i looked yeah. at i looked at the k1 filings that they did with yeah. the sec as well all their revenue they talk about being a tech company the user i think is 47 times in the entire k1 and all that but if you actually look at the revenue section what is it actually driving all their revenue mm. comes from subscriptions there's no tech element to that particular subscription okay. even in terms of expenses as well it's all gone towards leases where's mm. the technology element coming about so see technology should end up being one of those vain glorious words actually okay. thrown about technology needs to have a material impact on your business and the moment that bin- impact happens it can actually articulate that impact that's when you realize that you're actually using the right framework or not so as a tower accountant i can't exactly say that, okay use this this use this yeah. tech use react use rails yeah. use, use ruby on rails don't use java for this particular reason etc but this is how people actually look upon look upon the entire technology aspect so do you think that the you know the entire definition of business management is going to evolve uh keeping you know uh, in view the technology you know because obviously for people who don't understand technology uh they might obviously have difficulty managing these startups do you think it's important that uh, people who are you know managing these startups also need to have like very very core understanding of the technologies if it technologically illiterate you're basically dead okay you're a fossil <laughs> okay so i think that's the clearest statement you can actually make so even yeah. if you're a see if you're an mba or someone right mm. mba is everyone says that you need an mba to actually manage people who actually don't okay. mba is crashing like multiple streams of knowledge within a short span of like a couple of semesters mm. and they spend the remaining the next two semesters or the last year of the mba actually networking as well as trying to find a job yeah. so it crunches a lot so mba is in that integral but when you approach when you approach a technology business or unless you can use technology in your business you're not going to actually not going to survive mm. and technology is actually permeated each and every aspect of your entire business be it hr be it finance be it well technology whether be it marketing be it sales be it anything like that unless you can find a way to actually integrate technology into your business and not fight against it not rage against that particular machine you're not actually going to survive yeah right? so you see a number of people especially like i speak about the finance space that number of chara accounts oh technology is a passing i've actually heard senior chara accountants say technology is a passing fad is not going to do much <laughs> that's bullshit yeah. like the whole of accounting is so routine and rule based that you can actually automate it in fact yeah. <laughs> in fact when i was actually in college i started i started a company called numa that actually did the entire thing it automated accounting it yeah. did this entire framework that can actually automate everything all you have to do is all you have to tell it is what you what you own what you owe what mm. you bought and what you sold that's basically it it will do handle all the entries and everything else for you so it is possible right and technology is going to fundamentally disrupt all this yeah. the entire debate raging around the world is okay is technology and ai going to start reducing the number of jobs short term yes it will it's all the routine normal tasks that people actually do is boring repetitive tasks that are actually going to go away yeah those that is that is reality technology done that throughout the history of time mm. but what are the new jobs that are actually going to come about and those new jobs you actually need to understand coding you need to understand computer science you need yeah. to understand you need to understand i wouldn't say basic math but slightly more advanced mathematics as mm-hmm. well because all these underpin the society we live in as yeah. of now and if if our schools and our education system don't actually tackle this particular point then we're actually failing the next generation coming about yeah yeah exactly do you think that in future let's say uh, 20 years 30 years from now do you think these college degrees are going to be equally valuable like yep. if if of if obviously you know students are not learning the real life skills do you think that uh, they're going to be valuable there's a very interesting book i was actually I actually chanced about it's by a us professor called kaplan it's on the t- the center of education or something 
it actually shows how college degrees are no longer the signal that it used to be. Okay. A college degree now which actually signals that, okay, I can actually be physically present for a certain <laughs> amount of time, absorb yeah. certain knowledge, pass the exams, jump through hoops and run all this yeah. stuff so I can become a compliant cog in the entire machine. Oh. That's yeah. actually what college degrees have actually gone to signify now. It's mm. a signaling effect more than anything else. It doesn't mean that you're smart. Okay. Okay. It does. I don't have to go to college. Like when I went to college, they taught me all sorts of rubbish, rubbish stuff that I didn't have to bother learning. It was an extension of school. Mm. There wasn't as much freedom as what you actually typically afford to actually pick and choose what you wanted. Yeah. Right. So the college degree is no longer no longer the de facto thing saying that hey, it's no longer a signaling thing. Even researchers and hirers now are looking at okay, what have you done? I don't care which university you actually come from. Goldman Sachs actually relaxed the thing for only picking from the Ivy League colleges, saying what are the projects you've actually run. What is the impact you've actually created? Mm. So the moment we change that narrative and change the emphasis from looking at, okay, I, I went to like this, I went to this IIT and all that. Even we go from a regional, from a tier three city engineering college. If you're smart and you understand your stuff and you can articulate yeah. that properly, you can actually take on the best in the entire world. It really doesn't matter. Like the world also is moved, even from startups, there used to be a time and phase where the startup deck used to be, the, oh, I'm a founder from IIT, like give me mm. money. Like, dude, what have you done? <laughs> Doesn't matter if you came out of IIT, like hundreds hundreds and thousands of people come here of IIT. What makes you different? It, but IIT is no longer the signaling effect. I am yeah. someone significant. And Ivy League College is no longer the signaling effect. What have you actually gone and done? It can only take you like one, two years after college. After that, it becomes irrelevant. So college degrees are coming down. Vocational training and the emphasis on research is actually picking up to a larger extent. And I think this is, a, this is the way the world actually changes. And continuous learning, it's no longer a buzzword. Continuous learning has actually become a way of life for a yeah. number of people. Yeah. Uh, also, like, can you walk us through some of your investments in certain startups and what probably, if you can mention, like some of the things that you saw, you know, that impressed you, that you went ahead and invested. If you could just walk us through some of those. So I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll give you one of our most exceptional companies. It's a yeah. company called Licious. Yeah. Okay. So Licious is, uh, I think most of the people in Bangalore, Bombay, and a number mm. of places know Licious. But Licious, if you actually think about it, Licious feeds into a protein thesis that's uh, emerging in India. Mm. It's a gourmet meat product company. Yes. At the at the heart of it, right? Now, one of the things I actually said previously is, okay, we invest into technology and technology-enabled companies. Why would you go into like a go <laughs> product company? Yes. But when we invested in Licious, we actually helped them with the tech piece to a large extent. Because Licious, more than the meat of what they actually create, it's a mastery in technology. Okay. For you to get from the abattoir all the way to your house, hygienic, freshly prepared, freshly freshly cut meat, delivered delivered below, delivered below, not at freezing temperature, delivered at that very sweet spot between 0 to 4 degrees mm. to your house fresh, where you can actually taste a particular part. It's a logistical nightmare. Yeah. Unless you have technology running that entire part, you can actually do this. Scaling up, they're scaling up to about 86,000 odd orders, right? They're going to they're gonna scale up to a much larger extent. They did yeah. all this on the back of technology. So when we saw them in early 2015, one of the parts we actually looked at is, okay, like, Protein is not protein is not part of our thesis. Like, what mm. are we actually doing here? <laughs> then we started. As we then, what impressed us more is actually the founders. The founders okay. are one of the most passionate people that are actually about. They said, even if you don't get an investment from me, it doesn't matter. We're actually going to start with the entire business, and they started. Mm. They showed they showed initiative by actually starting out by a few few orders here and there and yeah. everything. And they actually started. When we worked with them, we realized how technology could be the differentiator for them. Yeah. So, Licious is differentiated as a business because of the quality of the product as well as the technology underpinning the entire part. And we have been there from that journey when they were worth $2 million. They raised around, they raised around uh, earlier this year, valuing them, valuing them about $150, $150 million. So, it's, yeah. been, it's been a fantastic journey for us. Hmm. It shows the role of technology. And this technology and helping technology actually leverage the entire business and become a business driver, actually help them scale and become as large as they have as of now. So it's the founding team, there's a role of technology in that. It's a role that the investor can actually play beyond capital. Yeah. Because we saw this was a white space, we could actually come and leverage our expertise to help them scale up. That's what we actually did and the proof's actually in the pudding as of now. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is one of those examples where, you know, the technology is trickling down to feed a protein deficient <laughs> India. But do you think like technology, I mean, these, these innovations can will eventually trickle down to the, you know, the poorest of the populations in the country? It and actually has. Yeah. So if you look at the fintech companies, com see, when everyone looks at fintech in the nation, people concentrate on your prepaid, your what the government calls the prepaid instruments, your wallets. Yeah. Right? Your Mobiquicks, your your Mobiquicks, Oxygen, Free Charge, Paytm. Paytm yeah. Paytm is the biggest example of that. There was a very basic level fintech. Mm. Okay, so that fintech hasn't actually done much for. Sorry, the fintech has actually brought people into a formal economy. You shouldn't discount that. But that is not the fintech people actually talk about. The fintech, the greatest piece of fintech innovation to come about in India, if you actually ask me, has actually been the Aadhaar stack. 
because okay. what aadhar aadhar is not people actually technically consider fintech because mm. identity but aadhar becomes the it's a fundamental architecture is the rails upon which the entire fintech boom in india has actually been crafted okay. because what aadhar fundamentally did aadhar solved the problem of identity mm. i can't enter the formal economy unless i can verify i am who i am right like the entire thing of crypto and all that is okay what role crypto actually helps in verifying that this person actually owns this particular yeah. asset therefore you can go sell it and okay. you can that trust deficit comes down to a large and you can verify on the public blockchain you can blockchain, verify yeah. on the public blockchain that's what aadhar actually did so moment aadhar came about aadhar helped bring uh, create an identity to 1.3 billion people mm. and the moment the question of identity was solved they followed this up by like uh, the the jandan yojana getting mm. everyone a formal bank account every single family in the country could use the government most people don't say this but kudos to the government every single family in the country actually has a bank account now yeah. along with this they have upi which allows them to enable uh, bank account to bank account transfers for free hmm? up to mm-hmm. up to uh, up to about 1 lakh nobody else in the world does it exist paypal square and all these guys came up as a business model because it was so painful to transfer money from one bank account to another in the west and mm. india because of co banking india has done this so india's financial fintech revolution happened and this is directly impacted every single person in the country so the person who had to go argue with a ration shop owner say that i de- i deserve these particular rations because here here's who i am and that person arbitrarily say you no longer do it they have direct benefit transfer straight to that bank account yeah. so that fintech that technology that he percolated down and because of the kyc aspect you can now actually start you can start dealing in finance you can actually start making the financial transactions you can actually start <laughs> investing in mutual funds even if it's 100 rupees or something you can invest in a mutual fund knowing fully well that you can redeem that money whenever yeah it's not like you're giving it to a money lender that person says okay i don't know who you are anymore get out it's actually formalized all of them to a large extent so yeah. that has trickled in india see india is not a top down economy india is a bottoms up economy mm. and because we created the rails thanks to aadhaar jandan yojana upi and the entire rails has been about that actually lifting the entire nation as we go along mm. so what are the applications we build upon this actually differentiating the loans that people give for 30 seconds and all that all the fintech lending companies that we leverage of this particular stack as well yeah your kyc aspect all this has been taken care of so fintech has reached the particular level and now with the Involvement of artificial intelligence and machine learning it actually helps discern broader trends. So even though I may not have a formal credit history, mm. because I have these kind of particular activities and research and my algorithms actually show that if I actually in, uh, indulge in these particular activities, I am a sort of credit worthy person. I actually get access to credit and capital, right? Mm. So all this has actually been happening at the bottom from bottoms up, and because India has 1.3 billion people now who are coming online. the geo connection about 450 million we have mm. about 800 800 900 million smartphones right all the people are coming online they're transacting online but the costs are actually reduced to a large extent so it has been a material impact even at the bottom of the pyramid as well as the top yeah so if you look at fintech i mean if you look at when uber and ola arrived obviously it disrupted the traditional automobile industry do you think fintech is going to do the same for the banking where the banking industry in india is already like going through a tough time do you think fintech is probably going to just overtake that or yep. do you think any scenario FinTech like that fintech is going to deceive if you think let's actually examine what a bank is mm. okay a bank is a bundle of various services of of a variety of services a bank is a bundle of identity that i am who i am as mm. an identity at kyc part because your bank account becomes a proof that you are who you are you can access a variety of services yeah. other that you saw that part a bank is a means of transactions for me to transfer money from one person to yes, another yes. upi has actually solved that part as well mm. so i no longer have to log on to my bank account and do an nft imps after 6 o'clock exactly. i can't do any ft i'm like oh dude i have to wait until tomorrow and all that shit all that all that's gone away yes right then after this a bank a bank is your fundamental means of investment So now because there's so many fintechs are coming up because I have identity I can actually go invest wherever yes. I'm no longer beholden to a bank to create an FD or do any of that stuff I can yeah. get like low I can get access to low cost low risk uh, debt and liquid funds yeah. which give me a higher yield as well banks have taken care of that so banks which have essentially bundled all these services together and are so over regulated in this country because <laughs> RBI has regulated them to the point the point where they no longer move i have actually had problems once opening a bank account this had actually happened like 3 uh, 4 uh, years ago but they rejected my application because i signed in a black pen <laughs> they said oh you signed in a black pen it means that it's a photocopy signature and you sign a blue pen i'm like do what the hell it's a it's a pen i'm the one who signed it yeah. i signed it in front of you like no sir yeah. you fill it up again and do it that's how strict the regulations were at a certain point in time mm. and you can't have innovation when it's so strictly regulated yeah. so what india is actually seeing in terms of a fintech is we are actually disintermediating the entire banks 
your KYC part is all taken away. Your transaction piece is completely taken away. Your credit piece is also completely gone to someone else. Mm. Right? And even it comes to business, business banking and business transactions, right? There's something called a new bank that's actually coming about. A new bank is just a technology layer sitting on top of the bank account that a company actually uh, interacts with. So hypothetically speaking, if you so for example, if you're a business. I'm the bank, and you've actually built you are you actually built your entire code saying okay fine I can I can handle let's say hundred thousand transactions a day. Mm. I no longer need to ping my particular bank account. I can get all my money into this account now because banks have a certain check. The moment banks see a certain volume of transactions coming about, they stop them. A number of fintech companies early on actually started getting their transactions blocked because mm. the bank said okay this hit our <laughs> hit our internal guidelines saying oh you can't process more than fifty transactions a day of a certain volume yeah. or so many transactions you must be doing some havala or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> huh? That's how bad it actually was. So because of these particular these these particular issues, we had an Indian solution. So, and you couldn't adopt your bank framework. You couldn't adopt. You couldn't openly access your bank APIs. You have to be a certain scale. So I'm a company just starting up. I can't actually make sure all my money goes in an account or for me to account for it. All the mm. money coming in. That's why new banks come about. They're the technology layer sitting between the user and the bank that actually helps adapt to your business and deals with the entire bank compliance on one side. So banks are now becoming essentially. You look at it. Banks are now just a repository of your money, mm. nothing else. Yeah, they are the place where you actually put your particular money. They handle all your compliances with everyone else, but every other aspect of your bank, of your banking experience, is now actually gone on to someone else. So banks yeah. are being disintermediated to a large extent. So banks, they have all the money. That's cool. They can earn whatever interest. So they, they have the have. liquidity. They, they have, have the liquidity. customers. They have, they have the money, but they have no one to lend. Yeah, they are now going to be dependent on startups for each and every piece of the entire thing. And yeah. that's how banking is actually being disintermediated in this country because of what Aadha created, because of what the fintech companies yeah. are actually leveraging. So, do you think that uh, fintech companies are going to take away customers from traditional banks, uh, or is it just going to be like this partnership where fintech, fintech sits hmm. on top of traditional banking? Fintech company, you see, it once again it depends. It depends on how the fintech space actually evolves. There are two means of evolving. One is something called, and this is happening around the world as well. Mm. There's something called a challenger bank that's actually coming. So, your Revolut, N26, and mm, all in yeah. the UK, where they say yeah. that okay. I will become a bank myself. I'll be an online only bank. You no longer get need a checkbook and yeah. go there and stand in a line and give give a chalan and do all that crazy stuff. And that's how they're approaching it. And in the UK, it's easy for them to get a banking license. And I think uh, uh, Revolut or someone actually said that they have they're getting more deposit than Barclays. Yeah, which is massive, right? Yeah. So that's your challenge of banks. The second aspect is your neo bank. So you have like Bank Open and a number of companies coming out in India that do that. They say, hey, we're not we're not going to be a bank. We be the technology layer enabling the bank. Mm. So banks aren't going to lose customers per se because banks in India will still remain the custodians of the account. Banks are going to lose transaction business mm. because all that transaction business is going to be run through the neo banks actually coming about. And unless you get that neo bank or that technology layer in between, people aren't going to come to you because once you get used, they become habit forming apps, right? It's like Uber. I can't imagine life without Uber and Ola anymore. I can't go back to haggling with auto drivers at 12 in the night for for whatever reason. I want to be able to click on a button for that to actually come. So that technology makes it so much easier for customers. That's how banking is going to evolve. So unless banks have to change their business model now, it's not going to be that lucrative for them anymore. Mm. They have to reduce their cost to a large extent and actually come and realize that they are going to be custodians of those accounts. And how do they create a business model around that particular framework itself? Sure. Uh, and if you if you go back to the government itself, we we're talking about Aadhaar, you know. But don't you think that the government, you know, uh, obviously mismanaged uh, the Aadhaar database? I mean, there was a alleged there was a alleged hack, and you know, and uh, so do you think that the government obviously should do more? Uh, if you look at a lot of the websites of the government, I mean, they're not even like encrypted. They lack a lot of the security certificates. So what's happening there? I mean, why isn't so the government see, taking it the seriously? Aadhaar the Aadhaar hacks weren't because they fundamentally hacked the Aadhaar database. Yeah. The Aadhaar hacks were because they actually hacked. They were social engineering around the database. Okay. So there were there were there were two types of hacks that actually came about. One is where someone actually managed to get get access to the entire database by by bribing someone, getting access to their uh, their this one username and password, and actually getting it. Mm. So that's not a fault of the database. That's okay. a fault of the person. Right. You can't exactly blame the database because even Google's thing, for example, if I have if I have you know access that I bribe someone actually got in, I can actually go and look at everything about everyone. Mm. So you can't blame the you can't blame the other database for that. The second part was I would say human error mm. where they went went and uploaded the name, address, and other number of a variety of people online. That's a stupid. Okay, but see the thing about the thing of way the Aadhaar was actually created because it was created by by a fantastic team of uh, engineers yes, and yeah. coders. Is that Aadhaar is not a store of transactions. Mm. Aadhaar doesn't know what you transacted, why you did. Aadhaar is a means of establishing establishing identity. So mm. I ping the Aadhaar database. So I want to let's say I want I want to open a mutual fund account. 
I go give them my Aadhaar. That will actually ping the Aadhaar database saying, okay, listen, I have so-and-so Aadhaar number. Is this guy legit or not? I get an OTP saying that, hey, so-and-so, so-and-so municipal company is asking me whether you authorize this or not. If you authorize, give them the OTP. You don't, just like say no one can report it. If I say yes, my established, my identity is established. The role of Aadhaar actually stops there. Hmm. In my UPI transactions, the Aadhaar is a means of establishing identity. It's not a store of transactions. So the Aadhaar hacks that have actually happened, everyone says, oh, my transaction uh, history and all is online. It's actually completely bunkum. Mm. But has government mismanaged Aadhaar? Government has mismanaged Aadhaar. Mm. The perception about Aadhaar and the way the narrative was hijacked by certain elements was not, it actually does disservice to Aadhaar as well. Yeah. That being said, there is a fundamental issue of privacy. Yeah. After the Supreme Court ruling, where the Supreme Court said the right to privacy is a fundamental right, we're still waiting for the data privacy bill to come about. The Shri Krishna, Comi- Shri Krishna Committee released his report earlier this year. Yeah. I think in the winter session of parliament, it should be tabled. When that is tabled, and your right to privacy is actually established and you have recourse to the courts of the land in case your privacy has been infringed in any way, I think that will go a long way in settling the other debate. But India's fintech revolution, Geo coming about and releasing, I think they were releasing like millions of SIM cards a day, would not have happened without the back, back of Aadhaar that's actually come about. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, and about like, obviously, AI is a huge buzzword. Do you think it's still a buzzword or is it just Put, it's, it's being put into action. Obviously, there's data everywhere. How are companies, yeah. according to you, how are companies going about artificial intelligence, particularly in the context of India? Yeah. So, uh, in AI, the hype overtook reality for yeah. a while. But I think the reality is now slowly catching up as well. Because, mm. see, that's, that's, that's the AI part in, in a nutshell. Now, AI, as I said, AI, AI, is, AI is how the internet was in the late 90s. Mm, yeah. It becomes a hygiene factor. Now, how you implement that hygiene factor, how do you do it, let's see, determine how. Like, around the 90s is when you had... Uh, the biggest example I would say is between Barnes and Nobles and Amazon. Barnes and Nobles, Barnes and Noble thought, hey, the internet is just like a passing fad. Screw mm-hmm. people are going to come to my brick and mortar stores. Amazon's like the internet's coming about. It's going to change the way we do commerce. People want to buy stuff online. They want to buy books online. Let's yeah. actually start feeding that. Yeah. Now who's there? Amazon's must be getting Barnes and Nobles. Barnes and Nobles is thrown on the wayside. Mm. Look at uh, this one. Uh, if you look at Redbox and uh, Redbox and Netflix hmm? mm. or Blockbuster and Netflix. Both of them start off similar. Netflix realized the internet's coming about, streaming is going to become an actual thing. They moved online. It's the same, but Blockbuster said, no, we're still going to be on, we're still going to be offline and all. They all died. Mm. It's the same way with AI, with artificial intelligence. You're sitting on huge repositories of data, but some of that data is also duplicated in other databases. How do you find the best algorithms to actually run upon your database for you to actually mine that data and for you to get actionable insights? See, all this once again becomes a translation of your application of technology to business outcomes, mm. right? It depends how you do it. There are even Visa, Visa, Mastercard actually have a team of 800 data science PhDs yeah. sitting there. Yeah. But the CEO actually said, I can't actually get actionable insights on time before my meeting. So mm. what am I doing with all these guys? Because it becomes so hard for them to actually marshal all this model. So startups have actually come about now saying that, hey, listen, I can actually, I can actually make this so much easier. I can actually create this sort of self-serve model where you can actually upload a thing. It refreshes, it refreshes as it goes about. The moment you change it, moment you change it, your data lake will actually adapt to that and it starts giving you actionable insights. That's how AI is actually changing. In India as well, a number of people are skeptical about AI because they think it's cool to say like, oh, this is all a passing fad and look at like all the negative stuff going about. But look at China. Hmm. China can actually identify its entire population within a second. <laughs> Huh? They actually put out a report recently where they said they can actually do that. This is yeah. because, number one, because of the infrastructure they have in terms of all the cameras, etc. But it's also in fact that that amount of machine learning has actually gone into it. That amount of AI, that's how much they've shifted through all that data. And you can't shift through all that data without having these algorithms. So AI is going to become a fundamental hygiene factor of business. No matter what business, if you're a Kirana store, if you're a Kirana store seller, if you're Infosys, you're Wipro, you're SBI, you're anyone, unless you have AI actually working for you and you start off mm. now, is it going to be a catch-up race and then going to be left far, far behind? Even as a nation as well, we do actually need a policy on artificial intelligence. We need yeah. to solve the various aspects and the various issues holding back AI in this country. I mean, we need a cohesive framework. Hmm? One of the yeah. biggest things, one of the biggest things, I think we, we discussed it previously yeah. also, is the fact that you can't actually patent or you can't actually copyright your code. Right? There are a number of advocates who are for it, a number of advocates who are against it. But as an AI startup, I'm still rather start off in Singapore or the US and mm. then come to India because I know whatever IP I create, I can actually protect. No one else can impinge upon my IP. No one can actually reverse engineer my code. Yeah. And someone hacks in my system, actually gets it out and all that. I actually have legal recourse to that. And India, we need to solve these issues. We need to solve the issue of privacy as well. 
if I want to, if I want to, if I want the right to erase or right to get all, right to remove all my data from that particular part, I should have the right to do so. We don't have that right as of now. Yeah. So AI, India needs an AI policy. No business is going to survive without AI actually going forward. The same yeah. way what the internet did. All these companies are going to be laid by the wayside. So all these skeptics need to put their mind aside. Need to actually start training the entire management team and getting rid of all these like technical MBAs or the finance guys sitting there. Okay, ROI, 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 ROI. So they are looking like okay, let me invest into this technology. Let me actually see what business is going to. Let me actually going to change my entire business and ha- adopt a more engineering mindset mm. rather than this myopic financial or MBA type mindset that's actually that actually is regnant in India. Oh, uh, you know, in framing the AI policy, there has been a lot of talks, but I I feel you know that it has gotten a little. It's been lagging in terms of the pace of innovation, right? It has. So how can it be expedited? Uh, you know, so that startups don't have to leave the country, so that you know the IP so remains. What we need see, what we I think the only AI AI articulation of AI that's come about in India has actually been through Niti Aayog in mm. their in their paper where they set about they set about saying that we need to have research institutes, we need to have proper proper protection, we need to have a data privacy framework as well as various other aspects. I mean they got the conversation going, but where have we gone since then? Mm. See, what's important to understand is government can't solve in India especially. What everyone has to understand is that the government can't solve all your problems. It behooves you to actually approach government, saying, "Here is a problem. Here is how you can actually solve it." To actually approach them, rather than sitting back, going on Twitter and shitting on the government the way everyone yeah. else, else actually does, right? I mean, being an armchair critic is the easiest thing. Yeah. But actually going down there and educating them on what is actually happening, it's it, educating what is happening can actually form in the change. Yeah. The U.S. You have your Facebook, Google, and all actually going, you have, going to the SEC, going to the FDA, going to all these people, uh, uh, yeah. the FCC as well, going to tell them that this is how this is how everything is changing. This is how you need to change your particular laws. Yeah. We engage with them. In India, the tech sector doesn't engage with the government as actively. We keep saying, "No, oh, I want to be as far away from government as possible." Government's a bad word. Unless we change our mindset, we're still going to have rotten rules. Mm. The rotten rules are a combination of there are some archaic elements in government that actually still believe that we're a sort of control thing, and we have to we have to legislate every single activity. Mm. But unless the startup and the ecosystems actually start coming about and saying, "No, this is wrong. This stuff is going to stifle innovation. Here's a better framework that to actually ad- uh, to actually adapt and adopt." It's not going to change. So in yeah. India as well, we're lacking behind because it can't be a top-down driven approach. We need to go engage with them, and we need to start banging the drum, saying India is lagging behind. Here's what we actually need to do. Here are the five things. They make these particular policy changes. In case you don't want to make these changes, explain to us why. Hmm. Hold them accountable. Unless we have civic action and we have actual lobbying within this country, transparent lobbying, not the sort of shady lobbying that happens uh, in certain yeah. parts of the world. Unless we have that transparent lobbying, we're not going to actually see the change that we actually want. But India, in spite of it, in, without the laws and all. It's Indian brains are actually powering, powering global AI. Yeah. One third of all the engineers in the US, in 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 any of these so-called AI startups or any companies, are actually of Indian origin. A third of all the founders in the technology realm are actually of Indian Indian or Indian origin. Indian brains are powering that. Now we need to ask ourselves why our best guys have to actually go abroad to in order to shine. Hmm. Why can't we do that in our own country? What are these things stopping us? Yeah. And the government is receptive at times. In certain areas, they are extremely receptive. Yeah. But it behooves us as the ecosystem. As partners to engage with the government, saying here's what we want. Unless the engagement happens, well, and we keep going on Twitter to abuse everyone, <laughs> that change isn't going to happen. Yeah. So, uh, if you look at the business models, a lot of large internet companies, you know, uh, it's kind of like we were winner takes all. Do you think similar kind of uh, thing is going to happen in India, where a few companies will pop and then they'll just take up the entire market share, or do you see like? Lot more companies. No. So see, India is too large a nation to be monopolized by one by okay. one company. If I was a smaller nation or something, I would articulate. I would I would gamble that yeah, it would be possible. India with 1.3 billion people, you can't. Look at China. See, China is the China is the perfect exemplar of this because China is a place where one can one company can actually rule everything. Mm. But in China also, there's competition. Yeah. You have your bad trio that are 42 percent of all the tech startups now, but it's still a trio, right? In India as well, I would see four, t- I would say three to four major players in almost every single field coming about, coming about and actually dominating. The question, the question that's going to face that India is going to face are those three, three to four companies going to be Indian, or are they going to be foreign companies? Mm. That's the entire, that's the entire, that's the entire thesis. The way I see it, because you look at e-commerce as well. E-commerce, we had. We had flip. We had we had three. We had Amazon. We had Flipkart. We had Snapdeal. Snapdeal, unfortunately, fell by the wayside. It's now yeah. bouncing back. If you actually look, sure. they're third largest in volumes as per reports. Flipkart got sold to Walmart and is Amazon. 
So in e-commerce, your top, out of your top three, only two left, and both of them are actually foreign-owned companies. Yeah. And now we suddenly have Reliance coming about, right? Yeah. And Reliance is there, Dmart is there. All these guys are actually surging up and saying, okay, listen, they spent. It's our country. We actually have. We actually have to fight back and take it. See the best example of this of the need for need for local companies to come about. It's a story that came about during the DD Uber wars of 2015-2016. Where Uber actually raised one billion dollars specifically for China. I think this is when they were valued at, um, I think about thirty-five, about for forty to forty-five billion, somewhere around that particular range. When Uber did that, the head of DD actually went to your Tencent, Tencent and Baidu, or uh, Tencent, Alibaba and Baidu, and said, "Uber raised one billion dollars to conquer my country, mm-hmm. to conquer our country. <laughs> Give me two billion dollars and I'll destroy them." Yeah. They got two billion. Now Didi raised Game of two billion. Didi, yeah, did he raise two billion dollars from these guys? Which Indian company can actually say they went to an Infosys, a TCS, an SBI, a HDFC, and all, and said, "Hey, listen, give me all this money. I'll actually take it about." They can't. We can't name yeah. a single one. So unless the ecosystem actually gets involved, it's not going to happen. So India as well. It's important for Indian companies to actually come about. Mm-hmm. We have an open playing field. But our playing field is crippled by the fact that all our companies, all our listed companies, are more enamored by foreign companies as opposed to yeah. Indian startups. <laughs> Why? Yeah. <laughs> huh? So we need to start. We need to shed this image that India, Indian, that Indian startups don't have quality. Indian startups are overvalued. Mm-hmm. Engage with them a little more deeply. Then you can actually bring that about. Or you want all your data and all to actually be, to actually be, actually be placed in servers elsewhere. Because yeah. the moment your data is outside this country, the laws of India aren't going to apply to that. Mm. Think about it. I can't go petition Google or something and try suing Google under what what jurisdiction? It'll be under U.S. jurisdiction. I'm yeah. technically I'm technically an alien in the U.S. Yeah. As per their definition, I w- I don't have the same rights as a citizen. That's why it's important for Indian companies to actually come about. Yeah, but then uh, when do you think that you know uh, companies like product-based software companies or like social media platforms like TikTok, you know, these kind of companies will emerge out of India? Because we haven't seen uh, many of those which you know dominate the global. Uh, scenario yeah so see we in the b2c space india has been fundamentally lacking because it's only very recently we have reached a critical point of people coming online for them to actually oh. for them to actually demand this right mm. india's youtube is youtube india's facebook is facebook yeah. whatsapp is whatsapp tiktok is tiktok etc we haven't seen yeah. anyone we have share chat that's actually come about but share chat share chat now also is it's fighting with tiktok and a number of things right but see india only very recently after geo to be hit the critical mass Yeah. required for consumers of internet consumers for us to warrant our own platform now will this platform actually come about i believe this platform may actually come about because see what's going to drive india is not going to be english english yeah. is a mainstay of about 100 125 million people but for the rest of the rest of the country they still laugh they laugh in the native i laugh in kannada i sleep i i eat i eat in yeah. tamil i sleep in malayalam i can actually i can i curse in bhojpuri i can yeah. do all these things right i mean it comes to these fundamental aspects of relaxing and all i do want to watch some english show about new york i rather watch about what's happening in basipur or how happy in bombay these kind of things so yeah. the plat the content is coming about that way now what happens there are two waves that happen in the rest of the world you have the platform and then the content is built on top yeah. like your youtube yeah. or in india or like a disney for example but you have the content and then you then you create the platform on top so disney did that disney had a fantastic amount of content now it's creating the entire uh, t- t- uh, the platform on top and they are actually coming up with the ott platform etc in india as well we have a large amount of content we reaching the critical mass of people who are coming online mm. and viewing yeah. so now these guys are actually thinking about okay how do i create the technology layer on top how do i create the platform so india's platform is start emerging it won't be the same as a youtube or a tiktok or something it'll be something more indian it will work in india but yeah. i think what works over here can actually be exported to a large chunk of the entire world the emerging world will find it far more palatable right see tiktok tiktok actually took off more than instagram in like places like africa china yeah. india and a number of places because tiktok was more attuned to the sort of emerging world this one your instagram was minimalist it was like yeah. this pastel shades kind of thing tiktok was more like it's like grimy it's fun it's dirty yeah. it's exciting it's it's engaging right that's why tiktok actually started doing that mm. so that's how see these platforms keep emerging and the way these wars and all happen the top the top 100 companies of of 50 years ago aren't even there in the top aren't even there in the top 100 now mm. huh look at yeah. how facebook facebook amazon all these guys have actually monopolized that yeah, so yeah, exactly. over time we see all these waves happening so we yeah. discount indian product companies coming about in p2p especially by doing fantastic work people don't actually don't actually look at that to a larger point p2p is not as sexy as b2c yeah right? but that's where the money is you that's know that's where the money is yeah. these are cash flow positive businesses these are companies that can list without suffering the same way what we work or what uber actually did yeah. but the thing is in india we don't 
we don't give them the sexy valuation that a company elsewhere has why is it because the because of the lack of hype where a, it's a lack of hype and we're also capital scarce nation okay See, some of our tech companies larger tech companies have this thing in their mind saying that oh i can build it like do you can build everything under the sun right if someone does it better you support them you help them grow like google google can build literally everything under the sun yeah. but google still supports buys companies does all this stuff why because they engage with the ecosystem because they can do things better than what you can and our tech companies haven't changed that services mindset hmm. into a more product mindset so that mindset shift is happening slowly there are some of them engaging deeper with these companies haven't started opening their purse strings yet and investing but they are engaging with them a little deeper and i see over time this will actually evolve but our b2b companies are still companies going to southeast asia they are actually going to the us they are going to china and a number of times you can actually some of these companies are also slightly confidential so i can't exactly name them but there are hrms companies like davenbox etc are going to southeast asia there's freshworks has gone to the us there's zoho that's gone almost the entire world right now inmobi is making fantastic inroads into mm. southeast asia into africa and to all these places as well right? so these are indian b2b companies and because we're so reliant on foreign capital they don't want to get those eye watering valuations these guys mm. are easily worth 5 6 times what their current valuation is but and this indian investors are seeing that value they all going to be led by foreign capital and foreign capital the the driving force behind them is growth yeah. right and b2b can't grow as quickly as b2c so they don't see the same oh. limelight and the same they don't attract the same amount of capital as what the b2c guys guys do so yeah another inno- innovation that's happening you know is uh, in the world of blockchain and the whole decentralized space do you think that there will be like decentralized apps coming out of here you know because a lot of innovation is happening but it's also kind of like unregulated outside Uh, the current scope of regulators you know a lot of complications what, how do you see this space evolving see i think crypto is not possible sorry blockchain is not a possibility it's an inevitability okay in the world so okay. in the world in the world includes india as well even the government also is talking about talking about a national blockchain is talking about all these things but we need to also help educate people to divorce the element of cryptocurrency hmm. from the underlying fundamental blockchain Okay yeah. so cryptocurrency is once again an application built on top of it. Hmm. Now the problem the problem with building this sort of currency type applications is all those are regulated. Yeah. The same old adage of okay let me break things, move fast, break things, screw regulation to help with it, I'll figure it out later and all that doesn't actually work in these sort of regulated spheres because it will come down hard on you and they will destroy and they will yeah. destroy you. And this happened in number of spaces number of times in India as well. So similar to blockchain also see blockchain is going to happen okay now it's up to it's up to them and there are certain requirements that the regulations have in terms of kyc in terms of prevention of money laundering and all this other stuff and it shouldn't run a foul of sort of existing existing regulatory frameworks right mm. so the cryptocurrency the blockchain enthusiasts within the country need to actually get together need to actually come about engage with the government and saying that okay fine here's how here's how we actually envisioning blockchain in the country here's what the rest of the world is doing yeah. let us know what your concerns are let us actually address them through the existing framework don't ban us out of existence yeah no country or no system ever ever can ever grow if your first thing is actually ban it you ban it is it going to put it out it's going to put out in the hinterlands it'll actually arise up somewhere else mm. most of our most of our uh, crypto companies actually went to singapore yeah There's simil- a huge sim- brain brain then that's happening there yeah similar to what you were mentioning about even the ai companies who can't protect their ip they may have to like register themselves in the us or singapore, singapore. as you mentioned so it's kind of like the similar situation and there is obviously this uh, uh you know a tussle between the regulators uh, as well as the innovators who don't care about the regulators they yeah. just because the whole premise of blockchain is decentralization and moving away from see, the see this decentralization like i said see decentralization you can happen but the moment if a witch hunt or something goes through you are doing a disservice to all the good that your technology can actually build yeah. why because you don't want the inconvenience of engaging with government if mm. you think it's beneath you or they aren't they can't understand it man it's your job to help educate them saying this is what's going to happen because at the end of the day it's their their mandate to create laws for the nation yeah. and if they create a law that outlaws entire business you're basically you're sitting in the pool why on earth would you actually do that to yourself yeah. put your ego aside go tell them that hey blockchain exists yeah here's how blockchain is doing down the rest of the world is it blockchain is fundamentally different from cryptocurrency here are the applications we can build on top of it if these applications align with any of the existing regulators let us work with them to actually create it will it take one and a half two years yeah but you'll be able to sleep well at night Yeah. you'll be able to run your business without the risk of sebi rbi or the government just outlawing you one day saying okay screw it you guys run mm. run a follow securities law monetary uh, monetary law you run a follow uh, uh, run a follow of existing prevention of money laundering act yeah. laws get out it doesn't work that way so unless you need 
India is not the same as the US or something like that, right? Mm. You need to understand you have to have an Indian approach to all this. Is the government willing to listen? The government is willing to listen on, in certain in certain regards, but you have yeah. to go engage with them. Is it a quick and easy process? Is not. It's a back breaking, very it's back breaking, time consuming work. Yeah. But you have to put in that particular initial investment. The tech becomes easier than the actual regulations in the space. Yeah. So let's let's focus on the tech part of it. Uh, what value can it create? Let's look at the value part of it. Of course, cryptocurrency is just one tool mm. using blockchain and you know uh, public blockchains. We can you know create cryptocurrency. But then there are other applications as well. So if you can talk so about one that. of the easiest applications, if you actually ask me, is in terms of land records. Yeah. India has a fundamental problem in terms of ascertaining whether this property or this asset. Actually it belongs to this individual or not yeah. because all our land records were created way back during the zamindari system hmm. like when the during british india even after it came about when the zamindari act was abolished a large amount of these land holdings got fractionalized amongst a number of farmers etc but they don't have title to that land yeah. they don't have proper documents if you remember the movie kosla ka gosla how someone just came and usurped it, he didn't have proper hmm. documents my documents are better than your documents if i go bribe a judge something hmm. this that and all all that happens then i lose the entire battle so yeah. blockchain can actually help cement that i am the owner of this particular asset come hello high water i i achieved ownership of this asset on so and so date at so and so time and so and so thing is there on the public blockchain is there for everyone to see yeah what are you going to do about it no one else can actually contest that you can't go reverse engineer you can't go fork that chain you can't go do any of that stuff to it yes. right it lets you solve fundamental problems within the entire country now yeah. is blockchain going to run something like a upi most probably not for those kind of small transactions you can't actually put on the blockchain because it's too energy cons- uh, consuming but these large high value transactions can actually happen to a blockchain a yeah. blockchain can actually solve these particular issues it will reduce the amount of shit that's actually clogging all our court systems most yeah. of courts is more court battles are actually around stuff like this right it's about land it's about land title land title battles or it's about a check bounce case or something like that let's help mitigate and reduce all that particular friction in the ecosystem and that's the potential actual potential of blockchain yeah the blockchain helps you establish identity it serves as a means of records that's inviolate nobody can actually impinge upon that i mean the applications are applications are humongous i can actually buy a painting or a part of a painting or a part of a building or a yeah. part of an asset and no one can actually challenge me on that because mm. it's part of the entire blockchain but see the flip side about this is the transparency it brings in there are certain people who want to do certain activities in an intransparent opaque fashion how do they actually do it with the blockchain yeah. so those are the kind of elements who may actually try preventing blockchain from coming about because that sunshine is the greatest disinfectant and some of these people don't want all the stuff that they have their dirty hands to actually be exposed to that right so those yeah. are the, some of the elements putting it but and this the good actually outweighs the evil that comes from this but unless we start engaging with this platform engaging with the regulators a little deeper is not is this going to be this sort of pie in the sky pipe dream it needs to be it needs to come into reality because it solve a number of india's problems yeah well i sh- we can say that you know the burden of innovation is a lot on startups you know that that are coming up whether they are coming up in ai whether they are coming in coming up in blockchain but then they they have to like fight this war with the regulators you know what can be done to you know help them understand the value of technology and how it can contribute to the economy and how they don't need to worry about it see what happens is you start getting individual champions who want to work in isolation hmm. you need all these guys to actually come together as part of a lobbying body or something and saying that hey listen i can actually do this like all mm. of us get together pool in our resources it becomes an easier battle for us to fight there are companies like infibe who have articulated creating blockchain technology but they do it in isolation reliance in terms of geo has spoken about blockchain sbi has spoken about blockchain only guys speaking about blockchain nice little pockets and the burden of innovation falls upon startups that's true but doesn't mean all the larger guys are actually lacking behind the larger guys are using the existing mechanisms using the existing avenues to actually further that goal is the startups who are creating a large amount of a large amount of noise is full of sound and fury signifying nothing yeah. get your act together come into a body go and engage with them put out position papers put out thought papers put out articles saying what the potential of blockchain can actually be how to actually mitigate some of these risk factors right everybody see the thing one of the things that plague indian startups is everyone gets so obsessed by technology that they don't care about all the other aspects of building a business okay. or creating that ecosystem value yeah. technology is one element of a much larger much larger body of work that goes into this you can't work in technology in isolation you build it and they will come yeah you can't just build this entire fantastic technology and if it gets banned later like oh dude he banned me is against anti innovation anti this anti that you build your technology help evangelize it help educate people about it help engage with various other stakeholders saying this is what you have to do and that burden falls upon falls upon the entrepreneur it falls upon the entrepreneur it falls upon the ecosystem and the entrepreneur has to be brave enough to say that my i can't exist in isolation yeah he has to be broad minded enough to say i can't exist in isolation i have to get all these people together and do it 
there's an Indian crab mentality that, oh, if I get into an association, he'll find out my secret, I'll find out his secret, how do I do this, all this. Let all that go. It's India is a large enough nation and blockchain technology like this is not going to be India isolated. Hmm. You can export it to the rest of the world. It becomes so much, it, be, it actually becomes so much more. Huh? And when yeah. we start doing all that, it actually becomes, it actually becomes far greater. Hmm? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I think I'll just end it up in a while. I think it's hmm. been like one hmm. hour. Uh, finally, I, I think you were one of those people, you know, who is analyzing and then analyzing deeply you know, the economic and the technology trends of the world. What is the biggest shift that's happening? I mean, in terms of, I, mean, I think we were talking about this earlier, you know, in terms of the macroeconomic trend, as well as, you know, w- how do you see it going, you know, in the next year, 2020? So 2020 is going to be a year that's actually up in the air. Uh, see, what's happening is there's been a global exodus from equities across mm-hmm. the world. A yeah. number of the larger investors are actually slowly, slowly, squaring off their positions in the listed space, etc. And they're actually sitting on cash now because there's a large amount of uncertainty that's happening. Mm. The entire growth engines of the world are actually stalling down. China, as I said, was growing at about 6%, 6% is the official figure. Most people say it's closer to 3.5%, 4%. India is now growing at 5. 5.4%. US is 25 Europe is going down. Uh, Latin America is burning. Africa is still in a nascent stage. Where is the growth left in the entire world? So the moment the growth rates actually come down, everyone's envision is that, okay, are these current assets inflated or not? Mm-hmm. And our uh, Sensex is all-time peak, Nifty is all-time peak, Nasdaq is all-time peak. All the guys are peaking. And if you're sitting on a large amount of money, that fear, that fear that I may actually lose this actually starts becoming greater. So what will start happening is that after December, sometime early next year, a number of the larger fund managers are going to start liquidating their positions. They're going to sitting on cash for the sake of conserving that money and for actually realizing their gains. Because as I said, paper gains don't translate to actual cash. When they start that entire thing, it may send a signal to the entire market saying that, okay, these guys are actually inflated, overinflated, let me actually start liquidating. And when that liquidation comes about, MA starts putting, the stock markets may actually crash. Whoa. And when all this crash actually happens, I know it's not going to be, I don't foresee this being so a crash. It's going to be like a ripple effect, obviously. It's going to be a ripple effect throughout the, across the entire world. Because see, I don't see this crash happening the same way 2008 happened. Because yeah. you don't have a fundamental asset bubble. You mm. have, some people say, like a startup asset bubble because of... Or could it also be like the debt crisis across the world? See, debt, debt, the way people think about debt should actually change. Debt, debt is the ability to repay. Mm, it's the yeah. ability to repay. Yeah. And the intent as well. The intent, mm. intent will always be there because intent is a matter of trust. The ability as well. You don't repay the entire, the US debt, I think is some 21 trillion or something as of mm. now, right? The GDP is also about 21 trillion. <laughs> so they can actually square it off pretty, pretty neatly. I mean, numerous sacrifices, but they can actually square it off. And they're not paying out that entire 21, bill, 21 trillion in one shot. They're paying it back over time. It's mm. the interest payments that come about. So those interest payments actually come about because of the growth in all these nations. Right? Mm. The moment the growth actually slows down, you have to analyze each and every one of the nations. Can this nation actually repay its obligations or not? And everyone talks about China, China, like, oh, China has been over leveraged. China has so much debt, state-owned enterprise. In China has so much debt in renminbi, mm. in local currency. Yeah. And the Chinese government is sitting on ton, billions and billions of dollars of cash because they ran a trade surplus with the rest of the world, which is what Trump has actually been trying to fight all this time, mm. right? So China, because it's local, it's one Chinese entity to another Chinese entity, they can wrap everything under the rug and actually solve it out. So Trump is fighting for something good? I mean, Trump, for the right thing? Trump, see, Trump is a person whose style has actually ruffled a number of people the wrong way. Okay. He's also a person who's mastered the ability to distract. Mm. So, signal and the noise effect, right? <laughs> okay. Is so that intentional? Signals, could be. Uh, it's, it's could be. It's up yeah. in the air, up in the air with him. People aren't, sh- some people say he's not smart enough to do that. Other people say he plays like 4D chess. If you look at the of memes Of course he's that. smart. Yeah. Huh? I mean, he's a he very is. successful businessman. He yeah. is. He is. He's a smart guy. I don't know whether it's sarcasm or not. But see, for a guy, he's a guy who managed to tap into the tap into the ethos of that nation and realize that a time was ripe for not some for time was ripe to disrupt politics. He's a person with zero experience. He's mm. not a senator, he's not a mayor, he hasn't done anything. He came in and became president. He went from zero to zero to hundred <laughs> in a short span of time. Yeah. And he managed to do it. He wrote that he wrote that baby. Even with China as well, he's tackling fundamental issues, fundamental issues that have been plaguing the rest of the world. Most none of very few countries in the world have actually dared to take on China on this. And China has been China has China has a history of actually running these sort of these trade surplus and all to a detriment of a country. See, trade is not supposed to be a zero-sum game. Everyone's supposed to actually yeah. come up, and you're supposed to pay, play by the same rules. If you're not playing by the same rules, it behooves the other to actually call them out and say that hey, you're not playing by the particular rules. Play by these rules. Yeah. 
and well, that's what the US and that's what Trump is actually doing as of now. Other tariffs and all, the best way of doing it, he's using that as an economic weapon because he's hitting China where it hurts most in terms of exports. Hmm. Right? And China is actually crumbling under that. So because China is decelerating as of now, India as well, India as well going on to 5.4 percent. That's the world. As a global asset allocator and money manager, principal protection is my is paramount to me. So I start liquidating, and that's when the entire slowdown happens. So when this slowdown happens, the countries that can't repay their money, the countries are going to get hurt the most. The uh, the countries that actually, the countries that have strong internal consumption and can keep driving their GDP through internal consumption rather than exports and all, will actually survive. India, 70% of our GDP growth comes through consumption. The US as well is significantly a consumption-driven economy. China is an export-driven and investment-driven economy. So they're going to feel the brunt of this happening. So uh, this is how we foresee the rest of the world happening. And along with this, I think a fundamental issue is going to be how the U.S. elections are going to pan out. Mm. Because there is a strong element over there of a sort of left-leaning socialist mindset coming. Which coming is, which is not good, I, I feel. For which, is not, which is not going to be conducive to business the yeah. way the world is, world is used to it as of yeah. now. Because some of, the, some of the senators are actually, some of the candidates from the left are actually saying that, oh, I'm going to tax. We can't have any billionaires in the country. We can't have any billion dollar ex- enterprises. Yeah, I'm going to start a wealth tax of 97%. The moment all this happens, there's going to be a there's going to be a flow of wealth away from that particular. There's going to be an economic yeah. drain that happens, and people are going to try actually fighting these particular. Yeah, but that could be good for India. I mean, that ca- that wealth can enter India. And That's what everyone thought when India did when uh, when people started getting manufacturing out of China. But India okay. hasn't seen India hasn't seen a large chunk of the manufacturing come here. Okay. Because see, India there are other restrictions of absorbing that amount of capital. It's what are your labor? India's labor regulations. Restrictions on absorbing capital that shouldn't be there. No, it's I guess, not a yeah. restriction absorbing capital. Is is your country conducive enough to actually run the same? kind of business the same efficiency the way it's done okay. as well. Our labor laws are still extremely archaic. Okay. I mean, our labor code is now uh, in the recent budget, they are now going to put four labor codes out to rationalize everything. When that happens, it'll free it up. It's still impossibly hard for a factory to fire people. Mm. Startups are easier to fire people okay. because they're not that as regulated. Okay. ITIT has done up unions, etc. Mm. But for those companies, it's impossibly hard for them to actually do it. If I'm a manufacturing business, I'm going to have a union, of course. How do I actually, in case my manufacturing activity goes on, how do I actually let go of people? How do I transition people? How do I follow them? I can't actually do that. And India has so many labor laws and regulations. So many in- inspectors can converge at your site and come and say, oh, this particular this particular piece of paper is not there. Or, you haven't followed this law, that law, that law. There are too many laws around. Unless we rationalize that labor code, we're not going to attract the same amount of investment in manufacturing or what India has been dreaming of for a long time. China manufacturing could get away with murder, literally, almost at times. Right? In India, we still we still have we still have very strong labor laws, but you need to rationalize those labor laws to actually adapt to the current to current modern framework, yeah. by ensuring that labor is not sacrificed on the altar on the altar of capitalism or productivity, but simultaneously ensuring that business can actually thrive in this particular environment. That balancing act is going to be crucial for India to absorb the money coming in, and even the money leaving going out of there, going out of the U.S. A lot of the money isn't going to come in the investment. A lot of money is just idle wealth. Okay. Now, what's going to absorb that idle wealth? If that idle wealth comes into place like India, which is it's a two point C, where two point seven trillion dollar economy, there are twenty one trillion dollar economy. Mm. There's only that much we can absorb. We are absorbing more. Our prices are going to inflate. There's a bubble going to be created. When that money oh. leaves, what bubble is it going to create? What mm. ripple effects going to have across the rest of the world? Right? Yeah. Because all your largest businesses actually domicile that if they move, holy shit, what's going to happen? Yeah. No one knows. These are the kind of uncertainties that are plaguing the world. I'm sorry, 2020 is going to be a very interesting year for a number of reasons. Okay, so when the dust settles, you know, when you know, uh, when the growth hmm. keep, you know, gets the pace, maybe after hmm. the recession, wh- what trend do you see, uh, you know, happening? And and uh, more importantly, should the world be scared of China? I mean, the way they are progressing, at least in terms of the AI, is it a good thing, bad thing? You know, should that AI be used for warfare? What could happen? Will we AI see a dystopian be, society? See, AI will be used for every application that humankind can think of, okay. including warfare. Okay. okay. So everyone talks about fourth generation war, which is actually war that's not going to be fought out in the battle phase. It's actually going to be fought online. Okay. It's going. To, that's that's how wars actually evolving over time. They're going to have attacks. You can actually you can actually attack the critical infrastructure of a, of a country because everything is online mm. now. I can actually hack into your power grid, I can actually cripple that entire thing. And hack into your stock market, I can buy out all value. Yeah. Right? These are the kind of these are kind of weapons that are at, at everyone's disposal. So China is still a question. The question about China isn't the technology they have, it's about the way they are applying it and the way they're exporting it. Okay? Mm. Because China plays by a different set of rules compared to the rest of the world. Yeah. China is not a democratic nation. The rule of law, the courts and all, actually, it's one central party controlling literally everything. Whereas yeah. in the rest of the world, you have a separate judiciary, you have a legislature, you have a parliament, you have all these different aspects. You have the executive, you have all these different aspects. 
Rachi converge together and there is a system of checks and balances that Rachi comes in. The yeah. system of checks and balances doesn't exist there. So how, what is the counterfoil to China going to be? In the current, econo- current world landscape, the best counterfoil is actually US. Because you look at the world, let's say when I end by this, you look at the world, there are three major systems that have actually come about. There's a US way of doing it, there's a China way of doing it. And these two are two polar opposites. And actually in between that lies India. So the blueprint and the way, the path that India actually takes forward will actually become the path that the rest of the world applies. Because it's the very old saying in this, Silicon Valley can build for the first one billion, one billion t- t- digital natives. India yeah. can be the country that actually builds for the remaining six billion. Yeah. So the path that India takes in this is going to be crucial. So be it AI, be it blockchain, be it privacy, be it open markets, be it economic policies, be it how we approach, how we approach social constructs. India is going to be the blueprint for the rest of the world and India has to pick the best from both regards and craft its own way in that. And that's how we can actually see India emerge. India will emerge stronger from all this, mm-hmm. but how much, what is the land grab we can actually do is still left up in the air now. Yeah. It's not a question of when, it's a question of how much. So in all of this, what is next for 314 Capital? We, we are currently, we'll be planning on raising our next fund pretty soon. Yeah. As well, we're just wrapping up. So for my 800 crores, we're planning on actually increasing the yeah. fund size. We're still in the early stages of debating what that actually is. But we still see our fundamental core uh, investment areas of technology and technology companies within India as he's still, as he's still driving the driving mm. majority of the value. India is now reaching that convergence point of $2,000 per capita per, per capita income. So the moment that happens, the consumption will actually start driving up to a large extent. Indian people are coming online, coming online in droves. We beat... Beauty Pie as well. Yeah. TCDs <laughs> obviously beat them by a really huge margin. And we see that India can actually start creating tech platforms that are coming about. Yeah. And because there's so many new technologies coming about, how do these technologies apply to solve India's problems? And how do we solve these problems? How do we export this so the rest of the world becomes crucial? So there's still a lot of white space left open in the country. I'm very happy to be part of this entire journey in the country. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming here. Yeah. Those were some brilliant insights. Your train of thought was just <laughs> phenomenal. And I'm... Uh, pleasure having you again. Uh, Happy to be. Thanks. Thank you very much.